Yeah, well, it's not. Is it? Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a tip. Okay, well, right. So this is a typical Tassie day. You know, uh, go 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 go. Everybody's exhausted, and we haven't even started the uh, student seminars. So that's why Tom was suggesting that student seminars. You don't need to go till ten o'clock every night, or else you'll completely collapse. Right, because you're already tired. Right, I could see. Yeah, uh, people are fading a little bit. So you all remember everything I said this morning, so I don't have to review it. So it's a good thing of uh, having two lectures in one day. So what I'm going to do today in the, in the afternoon, I'm going to continue a little bit more on the EFTs. And then I'm going to put fermions in. So then we'll have everything in the standard model. So then we'll talk a little bit about making the Higgs and how it decays. Matt introduced some of the numbers earlier. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then probably we won't get, get to it today, and it'll be tomorrow morning. I'll talk about how we actually search for these kappa deviations from uh, the standard model predictions. So where we left off was I had written down kappa w sorry I had written down a non-standard model interaction for the w's with the higgs and I pointed out that in the standard model kappa is 1 now the, if you only remember one thing from this morning what you should remember is that the standard model has no free parameters once we know the higgs mass that's it guys don't get to fudge at all there're no free parameters so it's a great theory okay so we're trying to parameterize deviations using kappas. And it's not just kappa w. I'm just using this for example. Of course, all the terms in the standard model with a Higgs get their own fudge factor that the experimentalists fit to. And I'll talk about that when I get to it. So we're going to try to construct a gauge invariant way of parameterizing deviations from the standard model. So we construct our effective Lagrangian. And that's where we stopped. Okay. So let me th think about how I could 
extract some effective Lagrangian terms that would change the Higgs couplings to W's. So let me write L effective equals L standard model. And I'm always going to write this to remind you that in the effective theory formalism, the standard model is just the same as it always is, with all its uh, parameters fixed. So let me write plus CWW over lambda squared, OWW plus CBB over lambda squared, OBB plus the plus dot dot dots is to remind you that there are lots of other gauge invariant operators. And I've listed them in the so-called Warsaw basis in my backups. But you're not going to learn anything by me spending 10 minutes writing them all down here. OK, so these guys are dimension 6. And what they are, O, W, W, phi, dagger phi. So these are the SU2 gauge invariant field strengths. And I can make a dimension 6 operator, this SU2 invariant, just by tacking on phi dagger phi to it. So that's the easiest way to get a set of dimension 6 operators which uh, can serve SU2. And so OBB, of course, you can all guess it. It's just the same thing, phi dagger phi, B mu nu, B mu nu. So this way of constructing an effective field theory is termed linear, the linear model. Ouch. And what that means is I've made one more assumption here, right? You guys all see the assumption I made here? I've assumed that the Higgs comes in a doublet when I've constructed it this way. So that's an assumption. It seems like a pretty good assumption, but it's an assumption, right? There are other ways of doing it where you don't assume that. But I'm always going to assume this linear representation where the Higgs comes from a doublet. OK, so now I've got my Lagrangian, and I can see what it does to any of my decays. And I'll just use h to WW as an example. So if I calculate h to WW, it's going to get some contributions from this term, right? W mu nu, W mu nu. If I calculate h to zz, it'll get contributions from the neutral part of this and from the neutral part of this. So h to zz will depend on these two guys. h to ww will only depend on this. OK, and if there are other operators in the theory, they'll contribute also. So this is not uh, the full story. So I'm going to calculate the amplitude for h goes to w plus w minus. And it's going to be the standard model piece, OK, just from here. And then, then it'll be a piece which is CWW over lambda squared times some stuff, OK? So this, OK, the amplitude, the standard model amplitude, some other stuff, which depends on this. But the point is, is that this stuff is not the same as this stuff, OK? So when I square this, I'm going to get I guess you can see back there. Gamma h goes to w plus w minus equals gamma standard model plus CWW over lambda squared times some stuff plus CWW over lambda squared squared times some stuff. And now you can see where all the fun of these effective theories comes in. Because first of all, this is not gamma standard model times 1 plus something. It's, it's got a different structure, OK? And what about these terms here? When I square the amplitude, here, you can't see them. How's that? Now you can see. When I square the amplitude, I get terms which go like 1 over lambda to the fourth if I just square them. But, 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 but. That seems like uh, it's not quite right, is it? Because I used the dimension 6 effect of Lagrangian up there. And if I'd included the dimension 8 terms, there would have been terms like that. So I have to be in a regime where these squared terms are small for this whole sort of idea to make any sense at all, right? Because I have to be in a regime where things are going to converge. Well, then you say, well, 
if I sort of say it's not valid any time these terms matter, you know, what, what good is this? So it's really only good for a CWW over lambda squared kind of small. As soon as these terms start to matter, then I need to add in the dimension 8 terms, which people have done, but uh, it's not pretty. Um, the other thing that you can see from this is that people have different prejudices about where these coefficients come from, depending on what kind of model you think is really up there at the high energy scales, lambda, right? You might think that CWW is of order g squared. That's one kind of model you might construct. On the other hand, you might think that CWW is of order g squared over 16 pi squared if you think it comes from something with a loop. Typically, what you, you do when you do this is you say, well, if I'm going to calculate the standard model and then include these dimension 4 terms, I really have to calculate the standard model at one loop to include the standard model 1 over 16 pi squared terms, which numerically might be the same as these guys, depending on your prejudice. Okay, now you've come to one more problem with this, okay? Because is this a renormalizable theory? You're used to thinking that only dimension 4 operators are renormalizable, right? You start adding higher dimension operators, you think you're going to get infinities. So how does this work? Well, it's, I'd say it's renormalizable, sort of. So I calculate the standard model. It's completely renormalizable. Then I start calculating loops in CWW. I'm going to get some poles, right? They're going to be 1 over epsilon poles. But those 1 over epsilon poles in CWW can be absorbed by a redefinition of the dimension 8 terms and so forth. So at every order in the expansion, I'm going to get poles, which I can then absorb in the next order. And Weinberg, I don't know how many years ago, a gazillion years ago, showed that you can always do this if you include, yeah, like I said, a gazillion years ago, before <laughs> these kids were born. <laughs> yeah. Was it? So he, he showed that you can always do this. If you include all the terms that are allowed by the symmetries, you can always absorb the poles in a redefinition at the next order. Okay. So, so it makes sense. It's messy and kind of ugly, but it's not crazy. It makes sense. Okay. Yes? So it's the claim that these are all the operators that are relevant to the Nope, I didn't say that. Okay. I said I was too lazy to write down the rest of them, and if you looked at the backup that I posted on the wiki, there are a bunch more. Um, <laughs> I claim that these are the trivial ones to write down and use in a TASI lecture, but no, there are lots of operators. Um, uh, yes? It will it depend it depends on how you define things and I don't want to get into the the basis. Yeah. All of this is scheme dependent, which is another messy thing. Yeah, it's completely scheme dependent. Yeah. So so the corollary to that statement is you better hope we find a Susie particle or a new resonance so that we can do new physics in a way that isn't this hard. Right? This is hard. Okay. So, but there's more problems with this way of looking at deviations from the standard model. And I'm going to illustrate them in a simple example by going back to the Goldstone bosons that we talked about this morning. Okay? And you'll see what happens then. Okay? So, my Escher 2 doublet, it's 1 over the square root of 2 e to the i omega i dot sigma i over 2v okay so these are the goldstone bosons up here there are three of them omega 1 2 3 dotted into the sigma matrices and then so you have a charged goldstone boson omega plus minus and a neutral goldstone boson which we usually call z so you can write the potential potential in terms of the Goldstone bosons, just by expanding the potential we had this morning, and it's mh squared over 2v h h squared plus z, ouch, this chalk is going to drive me nuts, 2 
omega plus omega minus. So these guys are the Goldstone bosons, the Z in the omega plus or minus, plus MH squared over 8B squared, H squared plus Z squared plus 2 omega plus omega minus. So you can take this potential and you can calculate things like the scattering of Goldstone bosons. And the reason you can use this to calculate the scattering of Goldstone bosons is something that's called the electroweak equivalence theorem, which is an old-fashioned thing, but it's still extremely useful. And what the electroweak equivalence theorem says, electroweak equivalence theorem, is that if I calculate the amplitude for a longitudinal vector boson, so this is a real W or a real Z, which is longitudinally polarized, so the scattering of some number of those guys going into some more longitudinal guys, uh, 1, B, L, 2, uh, N prime, say, I can get the scattering amplitude by calculating the amplitude for the omega I, da, 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 omega N going to omega I, da, 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 omega N prime. Out front, there's some minus signs, i to the n minus i to the n prime. And this relationship gets corrections of order mw squared over s. So at high energies, you can get the scattering of vector bosons from the scattering of Goldstone bosons. And this is extremely useful. In fact, recently I was trying to understand the electroweak logarithms in W pair production would come in at high energy. And so when I was looking at this, I realized that the way that, that people calculate it is by using the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem, so, which is kind of cute. So that's how they get these big Sudikoff logs, is using the Goldstone boson equivalence theorem. Yeah? How do you, I get it? Yeah. It's, it's, there's a very formal field theory proof. Um, the uh, poor man's way of doing this is this example I gave you this morning where I did H to W plus W minus, and then I put on the polarization tensors where they were P over MW, and you can get it that way too. But it's actually, there's a big field theory proof that it actually works. Yes? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. This whole thing is squared. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and you know this because this gives the h to the fourth terms, which are mh squared over 2v squared. Yes, thank you. Okay, so what can I do with this guy? Well, let me put it up here. Hmm. I'll put it up here and then put the board back. So, I always use dotted lines for the Goldstones. Omega plus, omega minus, h, omega plus. Omega minus Omega plus Omega minus H Omega plus Omega minus and then there's a four point Omega plus Omega minus Omega plus Omega minus Okay, so there we have the scattering of four Goldstone bosons two goes to two and I can calculate them from this potential, which I wrote down, so it's not very hard to do. And there's a classic paper by Lee Quig and Thacker, which if you haven't read, uh, you're going to flunk your final oral, because everybody should read this. It's one of those things. Okay, so then I can just calculate these guys. So at these vertices, I get mh squared over v, right? mh squared over v, and from that guy, I get mh squared over 2v squared. And if I calculate it, You'll believe that I can calculate this guy. So this amplitude, omega plus, omega minus, goes to omega plus, omega minus, is minus mh squared over v squared times s over s minus mh squared plus t over t minus mh squared. Okay, by combining the terms, that's what you get. So this is actually really interesting. This is a, 
an important result, and you'll see why in a second. So if, if I take s to infinity, I'm going to very, very large energies, what happens? This doesn't blow up, right? The s terms dominate, and these guys dominate, and this just goes to minus 2mh squared over v squared if I take s and t both to infinity. Okay, so there's nothing funny about taking the high energy limit here. Okay, so you guys all know that cross sections which, which grow with energy are bad, right? Yeah, yeah? Anybody want to admit that they don't know that? It's okay. Um, I put the derivation of the unitarity constraint in the backup. It takes about a half a page to derive it. But what it is, so this is unitarity. I'm restraining myself from deriving everything or else we never get anywhere. Um, unitarity just comes from the optical theorem, so there's no big assumptions here. And what it says is that the real part of the j equals zero partial wave, which is 1 over 16 pi s integral minus s to zero of the amplitude dt has got to be less than a half. And again, this really, really, truly just comes from the optical theorem. So if I take this amplitude over here, okay, and integrate it like that to get the j equals zero partial wave, you'll see that I don't violate unitarity for the Higgs mass less than about 800 GeV. Okay. However, however, let's go back to our effective field theory uh, analogy now. You can see in effective field theories, you're going to have a problem with this whole thing, right? You're going to have a problem. Everything's going to fall apart because I take this operator here, say OWW, -W, it's a dimension 6 operator. So I start calculating things like this. And what am I going to get to make the units work out right? There's a lambda squared downstairs. Yeah, yeah. I put lambda squared downstairs, and this is dimensionless. And what I'm going to get is amplitudes that grow with s over lambda squared times these ci coefficients. It's going to happen every time just by counting, unless you arrange it. So these effective field theories are going to have problems with unitarity violation. OK? Yeah. Well, this is an effective field theory, right? There's a cutoff. Yes, absolutely. Right, so there's going to be some scale where you have to cut it off. Yes, that's the whole point. You're not taking it to infinity, but it's going to grow with energy. So there, there is a point above which it can no longer be valid, which is the way I want to say it. Yep. Okay. Okay, so are there any questions on this? Because now I'm going to move on to including fermions in our theory before we continue some more. Yeah? The subscript is about L of the partial wave. What is the superscript zero in A? Oh, the J equals zero, L equals zero partial wave. I see. Yeah. I mean, you can do this for different partial waves. This is just the easiest. Usually it's the strongest constraint. Be because if you um, actually decompose this, if you're old-fashioned enough to decompose this amplitude into Legendre po polynomials, the first one has no cos theta dependence and just a constant. Yeah. Okay, so, so now let's put fermions in and see what happens to our model. So, yeah. Um, oh, they're suppressed, actually. I mean, you can actually, if, if you want to have some fun, you can calculate this just for real Ws, right? These guys, well, I'm think, always thinking in my mind of mh squared over v being a big number, right? The z exchange would have a g. So it's there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But this is, this is a big number. Yeah. And in fact, there's um, an old paper of Gordy Kane's, 
where he actually calculated W plus W minus longitude and put in all the diagrams, expanded everything, and you can see how the pieces cancel against each other to get this uh, simple-minded thing. But, but. Lee Quigg and Thacker did it with the Goldstones. They didn't do it with real Ws, which is a whole lot harder. <laughs> I mean, it's a whole lot harder. Um, no, they only had the gold stones in Lee Quigg and Thacker. What Lee Quigg and Thacker did that um, nobody else had done before is they actually made matrices. So they had coupled channels where they had w omega omega goes to ZZ and all the mixings and stuff, and you get str slightly stronger bounds. Okay, so why am I emphasizing this? Because a lot of you are going to go off and build new models of interesting things happening, right? And in your new models, the first thing you, you better check is this unitarity conservation to make sure that things are sensible. Okay, so with that said, I'm going to start to talk about fermions. So I haven't put any fermions into the model. So how do we know how to put fermions in? You all know that fermions are entered into the standard model as left-handed doublets. So where did that come from? Okay. It comes from muon decay, actually. Suppose I have a muon decaying to an electron and two neutrinos with an effective interaction. So we knew way back when that this was minus 2 square root of 2 G Fermi times two fermionic currents, J mu dagger, or J rho, J rho, where J rho is equal to nu bar E gamma rho 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 e plus mu okay. so how do we know that those are 1 minus gamma 5's instead of scalars or tensors okay it looks so far like I put it in by hand well we knew this because when you issued the pattern of the electron decays it would be different. It would have different uh, properties if it w this were a scale or a tensor. So there were a lot of old experiments where they did things like neutrino electron scattering, for example. And then they would measure all sorts of angular distributions. And they would look and see what happens if this were 1 plus gamma 5, what if it were a tensor. And so they verified that it was 1 minus gamma 5. So the weak interactions, which are parameterized here by G Fermi, involve 1 minus gamma 5s, left-handed fermions. Okay, so we have, we have our first effective field theory here. So we'll put the quarks and the leptons into left-handed doublets. And the left-handed doublet, what did I call it here? L. Okay, so we'll put them in as left-handed doublets and just couple them to the SU2 gauge bosons. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. Let's see if we can do. That. We'll write equals Let's see. Uh what do, how do I want to do this? I want to write L bar left gamma mu covariant derivative G mu plus I G over 2, same thing as this morning, sigma dot W plus I G prime over 2 B mu times L. All right. How's that? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to couple the left-handed doublets to the SU2 cross U1 fields, just like I did this morning. I know what the, uh, the physical fields are, the charge W's and the Z's from this, so I won't work them out again. So then I'm going to get from here electron neutrino with a W, right? That's what it's going to give me. And then it's going to couple... Well, let's, let's call this a muon since I was talking muon decay. Muon goes to electron neutrino. 
So all that's happened is I've taken my effective four Fermi interaction up there and replaced it by W exchange. Okay, so I know what this is. These vertices I just get from my Lagrange in there. So this thing, let me get my minus, my uh, factors right. Minus I G over two square root of two squared. Let's see how I did this. Nu bar E gamma mu one minus gamma five uh, E minus I over MW over Q squared minus MW squared minus IG over two square root of uh, Okay, so here's my interaction for the leptons here, just with a W exchange. Okay, so then the momentum carried by this W, since it comes from muon decay, is very, very small. So this is essentially just 1 over MW squared. So if I did my algebra right, I can match the W decay to the effective 4 fermion decay. And somebody, I get G Fermi over square root of 2 is equal to G squared over 8 MW squared. So the scale of weak interactions are set by muon decay. G squared, MW squared. Okay, and remember this morning I actually told you that MW squared is equal to G squared, V squared over 4. Okay, so you could put that in there. Uh huh. G Fermi over the square root of 2 is equal to 1 over 2V squared. Okay. G Fermi is measured exquisitely precisely for muon decay, so we actually know from that that V is equal to 246 GV. So we started, started life with a scalar potential, which was minus mu squared phi dagger phi plus lambda phi to the fourth. Remember that? A few hours ago. So the scalar potential had two parameters. It had mu squared and lambda. So we can change the, or trade those two parameters for V, 246 GeV, and the mass of the Higgs, 125 GeV. So ergo, there are absolutely no parameters left. Okay. So we can go through and couple, you know, the quarks in exactly the same way there. We can couple them. And from this, we'll not only get the coupling of the quarks to the Ws, we'll also get the couplings of the quarks to the Z. Okay? So it's a very nice theory. All right. So, so how do we get fermion masses? That's where this thing starts to get interesting here, right? Okay, everything looks pretty good in this theory. No free parameters. We got a charge W, we got a Z, we got a photon. Yes? So, the G Fermi we've known about since we started measuring nuclear decay. We sure have, yep. Becquerel. But we had to build the LHC to measure the VET, right? No, we knew it before we started. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Okay, well. We all knew it. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> yep, we knew it. And we kn no, I'm serious. And we, we knew it only in a theoretical perspective. We knew it from matching the effective field theory of uh, muon decay or beta decay to uh, the standard model. Yeah, so we knew it. it. It sets the scale, right? We didn't know the Higgs mass, right? The Higgs mass is free, we, so we didn't know that. So, right, but uh, we knew V, yeah. Okay. So that's actually a good point, because before, you know, the LHC and everything, we did all these studies of Higgs production, decays, you know, yada, yada, yada. But they only had one parameter. They only had the Higgs mass. They didn't have anything else in the standard model. And that's, of course, why it's so nice, is because it's predictive. Okay. Anybody else? No? Okay. I know I have a tendency to talk too fast. Okay, so now we want to finish up making this the world's classiest theory by putting some fermion masses in here. Okay, 
So mass terms for fermions. Where am I here? Minus m psi bar psi. Okay? That's a nice mass term. But now, how does this work? I've told you that fermions only interact with the weak interactions via a left-handed interaction, via 1 minus gamma 5. So, that means in order to put the right-handed fermions in, they're going to have to be singlets under SU2 because we don't want them to interact with the W. Otherwise, you wouldn't get this pattern. So I'm going to put my quarks in like that, but the right-handed guys, U right, D right, E right, these are going to be singlets. Singlets under SU2. So that way they're not going to interact with the W's. So that's very fine. I'll, I'll put them in. I've got my weak interactions just the way I want it. But now I can't give Higgs, I can't give the fermions any masses. Because suppose I expand this, I'll write a generic fermion mass term psi bar left, psi right, plus psi bar right, psi left. Okay? where psi left is 1 minus gamma 5 over 2 psi, and psi right is 1 plus gamma 5 over 2 psi. And if you like gymnastics with gamma matrices, Heather Logan's lecture notes have some nice gymnastics. So here's my mass term, psi bar left, psi right, psi bar right, psi left. That's a Fermian mass term. That's what it is. And just like we were not allowed to add mass terms for gauge bosons, we're not allowed to add this either. And why not? Yeah? You guys know, right? No, yeah. I, this guy is an SU2 doublet. It's not really, it, yeah. And this guy is an SU2 singlet. Right? So no can do. I'm not allowed to add mass terms. Okay? So let me remind you that the Higgs doublet equals 1 over square root in unitary gauge, because I'm lazy, v plus h. Okay, so there's the Higgs doublet. So I can add a term coupling this doublet to this doublet, right? Two, two SU2 doublets can make a doublet. So I can write a term. L is defined to be minus lambda d q bar left phi d right. I'm trying very hard to make my notation consistent, but uh, you'll let me know if I don't. So q bar left, here's an SU2 doublet. Here's phi, it's a doublet. So this guy is minus lambda d. I get v plus h over the square root of 2 from the bottom component here. And then I get uh, d bar left d right plus hc. OK, so I've constructed a mass term for the charge minus a third guys that conserves SU2 cross U1 gauge invariance. OK, and it's actually kind of interesting here because it comes in this combination v plus h. Okay? So the mass term is going to be lambda d v over the square root of 2. So this coupling of the Higgs to the fermions is fixed by the mass. Okay? So I can write this as, let's see here, md over v, d bar left, d right, 1 plus h over v. Uh, did I get that right? MD over V, 1, one plus D bar D. Uh, v. What am I doing? 1 plus H over V. That's indeed what I want. Uh, there, I, I don't need the V there. Yes. Yes. Okay. So it's the mass of the down quark, and then it's 1 plus H over V. So the couplings of the Higgs are proportional to the mass of the down quark, and it's always this combination, 1 plus h over v, that comes in. 
OK, so that's very nice. But, but you say, what about the up quark, right? This, this only works because of this. And of course, the up quark, let's see here. Okay, so I'm going to write the coupling of the up quark as minus lambda u q bar left, something I'm going to call phi twiddle, times u right plus hc. Okay, and phi twiddle is defined by I sigma t phi twiddle phi. Okay, so this is, this is the conjugate field, so it's a 2-bar of SU2, but for SU2, the 2-bar is the same as the 2. So this is, not the sa this is not true for SU3. The 3 is not the same as the 3-bar. But for SU2, it is, so I can write the conjugate field to write a mass term. And the conjugate field, if I just multiply out sigma 2 here, by twiddle, it's going to give me the v plus h over the square root of 2 upstairs, and actually a phi minus downstairs. Okay, so I, the vev is moved upstairs in the conjugate field, so this guy is going to give me the mass for the top quark. Okay, yes? Yeah, yeah, it is. Thank you. It sure is. Yes, thank you. Okay, right, and that's of course obvious because this is phi minus, not phi plus. Yeah. Okay, so, all right, we've got the couplings here, and it's really nice because you can see here that suppose now I start to think about generations, right? I got three generations of quarks. Sure. Okay, so what am I going to do for three generations? I'm going to put some indices on here, huh? So I'll put alpha, beta, alpha, beta. How's that? Where alpha and beta are generation indices. Okay, so that's nice. But the really nifty thing here is that if I diagonalize the couplings to uh, get the mass term, I diagonalize the mass matrix, which is lambda dv with the indices on, I'm also diagonalizing the coupling to the Higgs. So in the standard model, there are no flavor changing Higgs couplings from the fermions. Because I diagonalize the mass matrix, I diagonalize the couplings to the fermions. So this is pretty cool. At least I think it's pretty cool. Um, one more thing about the masses before I go back to my favorite effective theories is that this term here, this is how I gave mass to the charge two-thirds guys, or the top guys at the top of the doublets. For those of you who are SUSY fanatics, you know that in a supersymmetric model, you're only allowed to construct operators out of the fields. That's the SUSY rule. So you're not allowed to construct operators out of things like phi star, okay, to get supersymmetric things. So SUSY models always, always, always have at least two Higgs doublets. So what you do is you have to introduce another Higgs doublet with quantum numbers like this in order to give the charge two-thirds guys coupling. So that's a prediction of the SUSY models, is that if you're going to get your mass this way, you have at least two Higgs doublets. Okay. All right. Okay. So now you get a lot of really simple-minded uh, predictions out of this kind of analysis. For example, since the Higgs couplings are all proportional to their mass, you get things like the decay width of H to BB bar over the decay width of h to tau tau, plus minus, is equal to three colors, because the b is colored, times mb over m tau squared. Okay. So the Higgs couples to the heaviest thing around. So for 125 GeV Higgs, it pretty much always wants to couple to b's. Okay. The decay that's next to that is the Higgs to uh, WW star. And then they're all way down, as Matt said this morning, you know, Higgs to gamma gamma, that's super down there. Okay. And this is a problem, the Higgs to BB bar, because it's actually very difficult to see, because there are lots of uh, B quarks floating around the LHC. Okay. Anybody? No. All right. So, 
there are a couple things that come in from these Higgs uh, couplings here. The first one is, s suppose I take my mass eigenstates, I'll call them, I don't know, u left beta tilde. Let's make this be the mass eigenstate. So this is some matrix, which I'm going to call UU, alpha, beta, let's call this alpha in an attempt to get my indices right, type U left, U left tilde beta, where these are the mass eigenstates. Okay. Doesn't matter, but I'm trying to be consistent. Okay, so I'm going to diagonalize the uh, gauge eigenstates by some unitary matrix. I can always do that, right? That's how I get the diagonal matrices. And same thing for the down quarks. So D left alpha is going to be, I'll call it UD, alpha beta, D left tilde beta. Okay. So the gauge eigenstates are not the same as the mass eigenstates because we've diagonalized them when, through those Yukawa couplings to the Higgs up there. So what that means is that if I go back over right here, these are gauge eigenstates, right? So when I diagonalize to get to mass eigenstates, I get factors of u. Let's see, which way did I put the dagger? Okay. So I get these factors here from diagonalizing the mass matrix, and that these factors come in to uh, the couplings to the Ws. And this, you guys all know what this is, because this changes the couplings of the fermions to the Ws, right? So this is a CKM. So we, we get the CKM mixing matrix when we diagonalize the Higgs couplings. Okay. Well, this is really nice, but of course, in an effective field theory, it doesn't have to be this way. So if I just play my game of looking at dimension six operators, okay, I'll take my same couplings as up there. L goes like, I'll call it CT over lambda squared. Q bar left, phi tilde, Q right, uh, T right, I'll call it. T right. Okay, so this is that coupling up there that's going to give the top quark mass. And then I'll just put in a phi dagger phi to get my dimension six in my lazy way. Okay? So what happens here is phi dagger phi, this thing goes like B plus H squared over two. This thing goes like B plus H over the square root of two. And just by adding a term like this, the mass matrix and the Yukawa coupling are no longer proportional to each other. So in general, I'll have off-diagonal Yukawa couplings, right? Because when I diagonalize the mass matrix here, I'm not diagonalizing the Yukawa couplings. So this is how I would get things like Higgs to mu tau, for example, is by adding operators of this form, okay? So. All right. Okay, so now we've introduced the basics of the standard model. So let's just write down how we make the Higgs, how it decays, and then we can have some fun with it tomorrow. Okay, so how are we... Yes, oh, so absolutely. That, yeah, phi dagger phi is diagonal matrix in the flavor. Phi dagger phi has no flavor, right? It's yeah, just right. the So then uh, there was the original Yukawa coupling in this term. It seems like we use the same uh, U with a uh, unitary matrix diagonal without changing. Uh, no, you can't. And you know why? Is because this is V plus H cubed, not V plus H squared. So the term which is just proportion, which gives the mass, has a different coefficient than the term which is H. Yeah, yeah. Mul just multiply it out. So multiply that thing out and get the term which goes like B cubed. That'll be the term which gives you the mass, right? Okay? Then multiply it out and get the term which is proportional to H. 
which is the uh, Yukawa That's coupling. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fun though to do it. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And I actually checked it before these lectures to make sure I was doing it right. So I wouldn't want to give you a swindle. Okay. So how do we make the Higgs? Okay. okay. The Higgs doesn't couple the gluons because the gluon is massless. So the, the primary way we make the Higgs is glue glue goes to a top quark loop goes to a Higgs. And Matt had this one down this morning. So this is the dominant mechanism. I'm going to work this out probably in, on fr Thursday in detail how this works because it's kind of interesting. Because this coupling here is MT over B. But it turns out that as you take the top quark mass to infinity, this actually goes to a constant. So it counts the number of heavy fermions in the loop. This can also receive contributions from the B quark. Remember, the B quark is 5 GeV, and the top quark is 173. So the contributions from the B quark are very small. And in fact, they're negative. They're about minus 7%. So essentially, we make the Higgs from glue glue goes to a top virtual triangle goes to Higgs. The next way we make the Higgs Q Q prime W H Q Q Q bar prime. So two quarks spit off W's and the W's make a Higgs. So this process that I was talking about before WW goes to WW is kind of a real process because you could put the W's on here. Right? So it's a subset of this process. So this is called Vector boson fusion, VBF. Okay, and it's the next uh, most important process after glue glue goes to Higgs. It actually has a rather small rate. It's suppressed by more than an order of magnitude rather than this guy, but it's got some interesting properties because you can actually t tag these outgoing quarks so that you know you've got this signal. Okay. This this process is proportional to the top quark Yukawa. This is proportional to the WWH coupling. Okay? You can also make the Higgs from associated production, Q, Q bar, W, W, H. Again, it's proportional to the WWH coupling. And of course, these guys. These guys all have the same thing where you put Z's in, right? Where you have Z's instead of W's. Oh, and finally, the last important uh, production property is GG goes to two tops, and one of the tops spits off a Higgs. Higgs, top, 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 G, G. And this has a very small production rate at the LHC. Okay. And in fact, we haven't yet observed this. So this is a particularly important process to observe at the LHC, because if I measure Higgs production from here, I'm going to infer the coupling of the Higgs to the top quark, right? But maybe, maybe there's some, something else going on, and there's some pink elephants in here that are changing the rate, right? Might not be all the top quark. It might be some, something new that I don't know about. Whereas this would be a direct measurement of the top quark you call it. So we need to do that. Okay, so that's how we make the Higgs. This guy oh, it doesn't. It could. In fact, there's some there's some very interesting uh, results where it goes to tops. Tau, tau plus tau minus. It doesn't. It can go into any of its decay channels. I just drew it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the problem here. You gotta, you gotta tag these tops. And what happens? The tops decay to W's and B's, and then the W's decay to whatever, and the Higgs wants to decay to B's. So you have a final state with a whole boatload of B's, which is what makes it so hard to see. Yeah, I mean there are a lot of ideas for how you might see this, but you're not starting out with a very big rate is the problem. Yeah, people used to think it was impossible, and now they've decided that maybe it might be possible.
Yes. What's that? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, well, I'm going to work it out in detail, but it turns out that it's really, 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 really a really great approximation. Um, uh, yeah, it's. Yeah, um. Yeah, no, 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 it's extreme. I'm. Yeah, I don't want, I'm going to actually work it out. That's why I don't want to say anything that's too, too vague. But when you calculate this guy, you get some amplitude, which is a function of mh squared over 4mt squared. Okay, and this function very quickly actually asymptotes to its value when mt is infinity. So the reason this is important, and I'm going to make a big deal about this one, is that you want to actually calculate radiative corrections to all these guys. And so if you guys read the archive, you know you've got to calculate the fantastic number of n's to be respectable anymore, right? You can't just calculate, you know, NLO like us old folks used to do. You've got to have lots of n's. Okay. So it turns out that when you calculate the radiative corrections to this guy, the NLO corrections. Okay, so they're two loop corrections. So you've got diagrams like this, and you've got a whole boatload more. There are a lot of them where these, this is a top cork. And then you have corrections like this where you emit a real glue on. And this has been done exactly keeping the full two loop. Uh, amplitude here, it turns out that these corrections double this rate. So it's not a small effect. They double the rate. So that makes people think you got to go to the next order because if NLO doubles the rate, you better need NNLO. And well, NNLO is too hard for, you know, any ordinary woman to do. It's just too hard. It would be three loops, right, if, to do NNLO. So what you do is you take the MT goes to infinity limit of this, which makes this a point function this uh, one loop, and then NNLO is going to be two loops. And that's why it's so important to understand how good an approximation it is. Because now people have actually calculated three Ns, three NLOs to this guy. And it turns out that each time you calculate another order, the um, answer is actually interesting and important. It's, it's not small. So, so I'm going to wor work that out. To, okay. All right. So, yes. Is there an easy and quick way to understand why the NLO correction is the Um, is there an easy way to understand it? Um, well, you know, if you calculate, I've done two big radiative corrections in my life. One was that one, and one was uh, glue glue goes to TT bar, and this guy it also doubles the rate. So things which have gluons in the initial state tend to get these very large corrections, factors of two. I mean, they're proportional to alpha s. Um, yeah, it's really true. Believe me, it's true. So it's alpha s over pi. And then from this guy, you actually get a pi squared piece, too. So. No, no, no. That's a good theory. But actually, the NLO rate here is, I mean, there aren't very many diagrams because it's a two to one process. So it's not the number of diagrams. It's probably the pi squared that you get from uh, the gluon emission. But it always comes out that way. Okay. All right. So I've got about 20 minutes here. So, let's see what I'm going to do here. I think what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, electroweak radiative corrections here and how we knew the top quark and the Higgs math sort of before we started. Okay. So, this is a really nice theory, but it's not, it's not perfect. So, (sighs) 
So let's count parameters in this theory that we started out with. And I'm not going to talk about QCD. I'm just going to let QCD be separate here when I count my parameters. So it's an SU2 cross U1 theory. So we've got two coupling constants, one for the SU2 and one for the U1. The scalar potential had two terms. Which, as I said, we're going to trade these two terms for V and MH. Okay, so we got four parameters. And then we have all the fermion masses. So one important point about the standard model is I generated fermion masses over there, but I didn't tell you why the top quark was heavy. I put them in by hand, right? I said, here are the fermion masses, they're the Yukawa couplings. So this theory accommodates fermion masses, but it doesn't predict the fermion masses. It doesn't tell you anything about them. So they're input parameters also. Okay, so we got the fermion masses and we got four parameters, G, G prime, V, and MH. And typically, what we're going to do is trade these for alpha electromagnetic, 1 over 137, G Fermi, MZ, and MH. Okay, so I can take V, I wrote down the expression over there for V in terms of G Fermi, I got it, MH we measure, alpha, okay, G squared, G is E over sine theta, okay, so I could trade uh, G and G prime, sine theta, MZ, okay? So I can trade these parameters, and the reason I'm going to take G and G prime and trade them for MZ here in G Fermi and alpha is that these are the things that are very, very well measured. So, if I go back over here to my equation, which I nicely didn't erase, okay, we've got G Fermi over square root of 2 is G squared over 8MW squared, which is equal to pi alpha over 2, 1 minus MW squared over M z squared, mw squared, uh, mw squared down here. Okay, so g Fermi over the square root of 2, I'm just changing g for uh, e, e, e over sine theta, mw over mz, 1 of cos theta, or cos theta, not 1 over. Okay, so here's my relationship. So what does this tell me? This tells me that even before I did anything, I've got a prediction for the W mass, right? I predict the W mass in this theory if I use those numbers as my inputs, okay? W mass is a prediction, it's not a free parameter. Okay, what do you predict? You predict that MW is equal to 80 point nine three nine GeV. Well, it's close, but it's not really perfect since the W mass is about 83 GeV. Okay, so it doesn't really work. Yeah, yeah, I got my decimal point wrong, thank you. Yes, so 80.939 is not good enough, right? So, we got to put the radiative corrections into this formula. All right. Uh, I guess I'll write it over again. So I got to start calculating loop corrections to the W mass, the Z mass. Put them in. Do the one loop radiative corrections in the electroweak theory. Okay. So I'm going to write G Fermi is equal to to pi alpha square root of 2 mw squared sw squared and the, the standard way to do this is just 
shove all the radiative corrections into something we'll call delta R. Now this thing is a physical thing because everything in this equation is physical. G Fermi is physical, alpha, mw, sine theta, w, which is just given by the ratio of masses. So everything's physical. So this is a physical thing that I can calculate by calculating loop corrections to the w propagator. Okay, so I'm going to calculate loop corrections to the w propagator. Oh, in, in this, this case, cos theta w is defined to be mw over mz. So this is a scheme choice, yes. Yeah, there are other ways to define uh, the mixing angle, but this is the scheme choice I've chosen here. Yeah, good, thank you. So when I calculate the loop corrections to W from, say, a T and a B, I can extract delta R, and it's going to be delta R, and you'll see why I'm doing this in a minute, 3 over 8 G Fermi over the square root of 2 MT squared over pi squared, cw squared, over sw squared, plus dot, 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 where the, the dot, dot, dot means I only wrote down the term that I think is interesting, and the term that I think is interesting is the one that grows like mt squared. So the radiative corrections to this relationship grow like mt squared, okay? Anybody have an idea why that's, that's the case? Yeah, yeah, you were listening this morning. It's because the uh, WL goes to TB goes like MT over B. Yeah, the leading piece. The longitudinal gauge bosons couple proportionally to mass. So the longitudinal W, which is where all the action is, couples like MT. So you get an MT squared. So this is a very big correction here. I can do the same thing for a Higgs loop. Um, I'll write it down here. Let's see. I'll draw it like this. Here's H, W, W, W. And then if I calculate again the contribution to this relationship from the Higgs, delta R H, it's going to go, I'll put the coefficients in here, but it's very irrelevant. MW squared over pi squared log Let me emphasize that when you do this calculation, you actually have to include everything in the loop. So you've got to include uh, gauge bosons in the loop and goldstone bosons if you're in a gauge with goldstone bosons. You can't just calculate these guys. You've got to calculate the whole thing. So I'm just cherry picking the terms that I think are interesting. Because the Higgs contribution goes logarithmically, so it's a log MH. So we have this relationship here between G Fermi alpha, mw, sw, which goes like mt squared and log mh, okay? So, yes? Why would it disappear? Yeah, but there's a bunch of constant terms. I mean, there's a whole bunch of other terms. I mean, you've got to calculate the whole thing. I mean, th yeah. So they would come back other places. You would get a different answer. Yeah, Yeah, because this is a cheat. If I were really going to do this, I'd calculate all the diagrams and write down my renormalization coefficients and so forth and so on. Right? But I, I'm just uh, telling you what we knew because you asked, did we know V before uh, the LHC turned on? It turns out from this argument, we knew a lot more. Okay? 
And I have a pretty plot in the backup, but let me try to draw it. And I'm sure I'll get the slope wrong because I forgot to look at it right before. Uh, Okay, so what if I make a graph, MW, MT, okay? Top quark is measured. It's 173 plus or minus whatever. So here's the top quark. We know it's here, okay? W mass is measured. We know it's somewhere like this, got some error. So from the experimental measurement of the W and the T, we've got some band here. So now I'm going to take my electroweak theory, go back here and put all the terms in, you know, and say I'm going to put in the top quark mass, but I won't put in the W mass, say. And I'll see what happens as I change the Higgs mass. There are a lot of ways to play this game, by the way, what you put in and what you don't put in. And they've done it every which way in these, these fits here. But I'll say, I'm not going to put the W mass in because I'm going to see how well I can predict the W mass in my theory. So I'll fix the Higgs mass and calculate what it is. And if I fix the Higgs mass to be about 125, it goes right through these experimentally measured numbers. And this was done in the LEP era, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, a long time ago. Now if I say, because I'm back, you know, when you guys were in high school, what if I fix the Higgs mass to 600 and I put in my radiative corrections here and I see what I predict for the W mass, I get way down here. So this would be heavy and this would be light. Okay. So even before the LHC turned on, we knew that if the standard model was all there was in the world, i.e. there was nothing else coming into these radiative corrections, that the Higgs was likely to be relatively light because in order to get the W mass right, you had to have the Higgs light. So now the trouble with this kind of argument is, anybody want to tell me? I'm good at algebra. The algebra is right. That's not the trouble. Okay. The trouble with this kind of indirect argument is that I got it by calculating loop diagrams here with new stuff here. So I build a new model. Say a Susie model. I don't know. Whatever your favorite model is. And all that new stuff is going to come into this loop and then it's going to change this in inference over here. So it's completely possible to postulate new stuff and change this. But if the standard model is all that there is, that there's nothing else, then I claim we knew that the Higgs had to be light before we started. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and uh, we'll continue tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was 115 to 125 or something on that one. Yeah, really. But see, back in those days, everybody thought it's got to be Susie so that this was bullshit. But uh, no, I think it was 115. So I guess that was not enough motivation to build an LHC. Like well, the trouble is, if you're thinking about history, everybody thought that there was Susie at that time, which completely changes all of this. But it's really pretty, though. I mean, 600 is way off if you look at it. But it's nice to see all the pieces that go together, you know? Isn't that cool? You never saw that? There's not only the total mass, it's a bunch of precision observables. Oh, yeah, it's not just these guys, they just global things, right? Yeah. I have a question. So we're talking about the four years, the gold symbols and the women's theorem.